there's four DFARS rules that really are setting the stage for everything that goes on with uh, what is currently going on with CMMC and all the regulatory requirements around cybersecurity um, and, uh, and, and compliance. And so the first one is uh, DFARS 252-204-7012. Uh, this was the original DFARS clause uh, addressing cybersecurity and reporting. came out in 2016, and so we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And then we had three more rules that came out um, uh, about the same time that CMMC started being talked about, uh, which is 252-204-7019, 7020, and 7021. And I'm going to run through a quick overview of each one of those DFARS rules and what they actually mean. And so, you know, what you need to be looking for as you are uh, signing new contracts and uh, the kinds of expectations that you're going to be required, that you're going to have, the government's going to have of you as you are, um, as you sign those contracts, basically what you're, you're, you're taking on uh, by signing those contracts with those clauses in it. So the first one, with DFARS 252-204-7012, it's called Safeguarding Covered Defense Information and Cyber Incident Reporting. Like I said, this was the first DFARS clause uh, that really, um, you know, brought NIST 800-171 to the, to the limelight, to the forefront. Um, and and it, was, it came out in uh, 2016 with an implementation date of December 31st, 2017. So it has been around for about five years. Um, and and this is, uh, these requirements, like I said, have been around for about five years. And then the CMMC program and the other DFARS clauses came along um, later as a method to uh, essentially assess the implementation of the DFARS 7012 clause. So um, four main points about this clause. First, uh, the entire point of the clause was to, provi- uh, to ensure that contractors were providing adequate security for their covered contractor information system. And what does adequate security actually mean? Well, first, adequate security basically means uh, that you are implementing the NIST 800-171 R2 uh, framework within your IT environment. And the and NIST 800 is 110 uh, security controls uh, that are implemented uh, in your environment to protect yourself um, from a security standpoint um, from various types of threats. And uh, if you're going to be using cloud-based systems, DFAR 7012 requires you to use FedRAMP moderate or FedRAMP moderate equivalent cloud service providers if you're going to be using cloud-based systems. So if you have anything in the cloud where you're handling or controlling or uh, managing controlled and classified information, that IT environment, that CSP or cloud solution provider must be FedRAMP moderate or FedRAMP moderate equivalent or higher. Uh, the higher standard would be FedRAMP high. Okay. The second piece of DFAR 7012 is the reporting component. Uh, so you are required to rapidly report cyber incidents to the Department of Defense. And what rapidly means is within 72 hours of identifying the incident, you have to report that incident uh, to the Department of, De- Department of Defense. Um, you have to be able to report that incident. Um, you, use, you go to dibnet.gov, and, um, and that uh, URL, you will log into that URL with a medium assurance certificate. So you have to actually get a certificate. Um, so it's certificate-based authentication. You'll log in with that certificate, um, and that's how you will actually submit your incidents into um, into uh, DibNet. Now, in addition to that, you also there are also paragraphs C through G in the DFARS clause, and these uh, paragraphs have to do with uh, basically being able to do forensics on the environment and provide that information to the government in case you have to do a report. Um, so you have to be able to uh, you know take take forensic information and provide that to the government. Um, so make sure that you're reading paragraphs C through G for all those requirements that come along with DFAR 7012. The third piece are flowdowns. The government wants to make sure that um, these requirements follow the data. So controlled and classified information, wherever that controlled and classified information flows to, uh, you have to flow down this clause to them. So any subcontractor that you may have uh, where they are getting controlled and classified information from you or where they are creating controlled and classified information as part of the contract, you have to flow down this DFAR 7012 clause to them in your contracts. Now, this contract has been this clause has been in place uh, for most contracts since 2016, 2017, um, and it went fully into effect uh, from a compliance standpoint on December 31st, 2017. Okay, so that's the first and probably, honestly, the most important of all the DFARS clauses. The rest of the DFARS clauses in this area are really are, are really in place uh, to ensure that you are. Um, you, that you're basically uh, implementing the requirements as, as necessary um, and, and doing a different assessment types against those requirements. Okay? 
So I have a couple questions here I'm going to look for. The first question is, do the same requirements flow down to one-person consultancies as apply to small and large companies? Uh, the answer to that is yes. And so if, if that small one-person company is handling controlled unclassified information, they will have exactly the same requirements to protect that controlled unclassified information as Boeing or Raytheon or L3 Harris or any other large defense contractor would have. So the same exact requirements apply regardless of company size. It's all about the data that is being uh, protected or, uh, or used. So I've got a question here. Uh, is there an expectation for most contracts to be solicited with a particular CMMC level? Is there an expectation on what level requirement would be required for particular types of contracts? So I'll get into a little bit more about the CMMC levels here in a few minutes. Uh, but in general, uh, yes, uh, based on the type of data that will be managed as part of that contract, then they will identify a specific level for the contract. If the contract is dealing with what's called uh, FCI or um, federal contract information, then it is expected that the, um, that the level on that contract will be a CMMC level one. If it's dealing with controlled unclassified information, the expectation is that that contract would be a CMMC level two. Um, potentially, uh, there could be contracts that would be CMMC level three. As I'll mention er uh, later, we don't really have all the requirements for CMMC level three at this point, and so we're still waiting on getting the final requirements for that. Um, but the numbers are going to be pretty low on actual CMMC level three contracts based on what the government has told us thus far. Okay. All right, let's see. I'll take one more question here. Got one question. I understand that CUI can only be determined by our U.S. government customer and that industry members cannot make CUI determination unless directed by the government. Uh, very few of our U.S. government customers have currently identified CUI on our contracts. So should, should this be flowed down? Okay, so that's actually incorrect. Um, CUI is determined by the type of data. It is not determined by the government only. So any contractor that is dealing with content that meets the CUI registry, the requirements of the CUI registry, can be determined and marked as CUI. So you may receive CUI information from the government. You may create CUI con uh, information on your contract. For example, if you do an analysis, for example, of a, uh, let's say you're working on a missile defense contract, and uh, as part of your contract, you are doing uh, ballistics analysis of a specific missile or missile type. Uh, then the, that, and that, that data, that um, analysis, would be considered controlled and classified information, um, and you would need to mark that information as controlled and classified information, even though it was not sent directly to you by the government. You created it on contract. And the same holds true for all of your subcontractors if they are creating content that meets the requirements of controlled and classified information as defined in the registry, if you look in the, uh, the CUI registry at NARA. Okay? All right. So let's go ahead to the next one. So the second clause is 252-204-7019, uh, the Notice of NIST SP-80171 DOD Assessment Requirements. So this uh, DFARS clause, if you find it in your contract, essentially what it is telling you is that you have to submit a basic assessment to the SPRS, the Supplier Performance Risk System, um, as part of your contract requirements. Now, this contract requirement is already in contracts today, and it is live. So if you look through your contracts, just like the 7012 clause, you're likely going to find a 7019 clause in your contracts. There are three types of assessments that the government is, um, has basically set up as part of, of 7019. The first type of assessment is called a basic assessment. This is self-attestation, where you go through and you use the DOD assessment methodology that I have linked on the screen to build out an assessment for your environment using NIST 800-171A, which is the assessment guide for NIST 800-171. So you're not going to be looking at just the, uh, the 110 controls as part of NIST 800-171. You're going to be looking at all 320 determination statements that make up the 110 controls and determining if you're meeting each and every one of those 320 determination statements. And if you miss any of the, if you have, if you're not meeting the requirements of any one of the determination statements in a specific control, then that control is not being met. And so once you use that assessment methodology to build out your SPRS score, then you would log in to the SP, uh, SPRS link that you see there on the left. You would enter in your score, and then um, as you update your POAM and you knock off POAM items, you will need to go back and update your score over and over again until you get to the point where you're at 110. Okay, so that is a basic assessment. 
The medium and high assessments are assessments that are going to be conducted specifically by the DCMA. So you will be contacted by the government, uh, and the government will tell you what type of assessment they want to conduct and what the schedule for that assessment will be. Medium assessments right now are being executed on a five-day notice uh, to provide a system security plan. They are basically documentation reviews at this point. And so what would happen if you get identified for a medium assessment by DCMA, you will be contacted on a Monday. DCMA will say, provide us your SSP, your system security plan, by Friday for us to begin our review. And you will have five days to provide your SSP uh, to DCMA for their review. Um, if they contact you for a high assessment, a high ass assessment is when they are going to uh, do a full, essentially a full assessment of your entire environment. SSP, they're going to go through and look at, you know, they're going to ask questions. They're going to want to see um, all of the um, evidence that you are meeting all of the necessary requirements. It is a much deeper look into your environment. Um, those typically are given a 30-day notice. And so they will contact you until you have 30 days that, 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 um, to be ready for an assessment. And, uh, and then they, they will either come on site or they may be doing those um, uh, remotely. They've been doing them remotely for a little while now where they will do a remote uh, DIB, uh, DCMA DIBCAC high assessment. So you just have to be ready for that within 30 days. Okay? All right. 7020, 252-204-7020 goes along with 7019, and essentially what it is, is it ensures that when uh, DCMA, the DIBCAC team, comes to your organization to execute a high assessment, that you're required to give them access to be able to do that assessment, okay? So the first thing um, is access. They want to make sure that when they show up at your facility or when they call you up and say, hey, we need to do a high assessment, that you're going to actually give them the necessary access to the environment uh, for them to look at the evidence to review systems, uh, to look at the physical env environment, um, and to ask questions of your people uh, to execute that assessment. The second piece of it is um, flow downs. Again, uh, talking about flow downs just like we have with 7012, they want to make sure that this requirement is flowed down to um, all of your subcontractors so that um, anybody in your supply chain will, will be subject to the same exact requirements that you're subject to when it comes to um, doing these assessments and allowing them on site to do assessments if necessary. And then the third requirement that is in uh, 7020 requires um, contractors to ensure that all of your subcontractors, all of your supply chain, are submitting their scores um, with a basic self-assessment into SPRS. So if you have five contractors, you're responsible for making sure that all of those five subcontractors are submitting into SPRS. And then they're responsible for any of their sub subcontractors to submit into SPRS. And then that tier is responsible for all of their subcontractors to submit into SPRS. This is the government's way of ensuring that um, all uh, companies in the DOD supply chain that touch uh, controlled and classified information are going to get a uh, are, are going to get uh, a score into SPRS. Okay, now this clause again is in contracts and is being enforced currently. So we have four different control or four different defaults clauses that we're talking about here. Three of these are fully in contracts today and are being enforced and at, are as part of contracts that exist uh, today. Okay. So I'm going to look at some of these questions, and we'll take, we'll take a couple of those before we jump into uh, the 7021 clause. Okay, I have one question here on CUI again. How do we know if we're creating new CUI? Well, um, I would recommend that you, get, um, that you uh, get very familiar with the CUI registry uh, that is at NORA. Um, and that registry lists out all the different types of CUI, and then you will need to uh, you'll need to go through that listing of CUI types to determine you know what type of information you may be handling that is controlled and classified information. You can al also talk to your program manager or your prime contractor, and they can probably give you a good idea of what type of CUI um, uh, you may be dealing with as well. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so here's a good question, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. Does the compliance flow down to the MSP who is supporting the company's IT infrastructure? Yes, it does. So if that uh, MSP is, um, is handling um, or providing protection to systems 
that are um, that are holding or handling CUI information, then that MSP is also going to have to meet these same security requirements. So I have a question. When should companies be compliant with the 110 controls? Uh, companies were supposed to be compliant with the 110 controls on December 31st of 2017. Um, that is uh, the date that, that um, DFAR 7012 went into effect. Um, there was a period of time where the government basically said, um, you know, you just have to have an SSP and a POAM, and we will, you know, we'll check you off as long as you're making progress. Um, but given that that was five years ago now, at this point, all companies that have a DFAR 7012 clause should have all 110 controls in place and, uh, and compliant. Okay. So I have a question here. Do these flowdowns apply to universities on a program? So the answer to that is yes, they do. And so if that university has signed a contract with the DOD um, and that contract has a DFAR 7012 clause in it, a 7020, a 7019 clause, then you are going, that university is going to be subject to these same requirements just as if any other company would be subject to these requirements. Okay, all right. So with that, we're going to move into the, uh, the 7021 clause. All right, the DFARS, uh, the 252-204-7021 uh, clause, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Requirements. So this clause originally came out a couple of years ago. Um, it went into a DOD review, and I'll walk through the timeline here in a second, but now it has been split into two different rulemaking processes. One rulemaking process is a 32 CFR rulemaking process, and the second rulemaking process is a 48 CFR rulemaking process, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here in just a second. Essentially what this CMMC requirement is, is it requires a third-party assessment of your compliance with NIST 800171. So CMMC in and of itself is not adding any new requirements uh, to the uh, to you know your existing requirements under DFAR 7012. What it is doing is it's requiring you to get a third party assessment that you are meeting these requirements rather than submitting just a self assessment. Okay, the government uh, tried self assessment with DFAR 7012. It was an abject failure. Um, after you know, they went out and did you know many uh, you know many assessments of companies that had submitted that they were doing you know that they were meeting the requirements and they were not meeting even a, a fraction of the requirements that they were supposed to be meeting and so that's why CMMC was created was to require a third party assessment of the organizations required to meet these uh, these controls. Okay, it does make CMMC a full regulatory requirement. It is going to cover all contracts, task orders, solicitations, except for commercial off-the-shelf and micro-purchases. Um, micro-purchases, I believe, are under $10,000, um, and, and typically those are also COTS. And so anything else uh, will be covered by this, uh, this uh, rule uh, once it moves into its uh, final stage. Okay, um, It does require compliance at the contract award point. Um, or at option uh, an option year award if that option year in award includes the clause. Um, you do have to maintain the CMMC level that is called out within that contract uh, for the duration of that contract. And right now it's believed that there are about 300,000 companies uh, that are going to, have to be subject to CMMC as part of the DOD's efforts. Um, and that covers everything from CMMC level one to CMMC level three.